Hi, my name is Dr. David Yitsky, and I'm bringing you another installment from the My CPE Shorts. Uh, to give you a little on my background, I've worked with uh, Army uh, Special Operations uh, for a decade, and I've been an agent with the federal government in Cybercrimes Headquarters uh, for 15 years. I now work in the private sector, working with, uh, continuing to work with digital assets, distributed ledger technology, AI, uh, extended reality, XR, um, which I've done for the last 35 plus years. So today I'm bringing another uh, cyber uh, attack situation to your attention. It occurred a little over 10 days ago uh, and there's been quite a bit of information that's continued to roll out on it. Uh, so apologize for the delayed response, but I think it's important that we still cover this even though it didn't happen like yesterday from the standpoint of just protecting yourself, which we'll cover, uh, I'll, I'll cover towards the end here. But uh, the attack was actually involved Google Fi, which if you're not familiar with what that is, it is a, a wireless uh, Wi-Fi actually, uh, phone service through Google. But the, the attack came from actually T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile announced last month that it had had a breach of data of approximately 37 million uh, customers. That also involved uh, Google Fi customers. And it's like, well, how does that happen? And so Google Fi actually has a couple contracts with cellular car uh, carriers, uh, T-Mobile being one of them, so when uh, a customer of Google Fi doesn't have access to Wi-Fi, uh, they have the backup cellular uh, component to be able to provide service to customers. So the T-Mobile breach led to the infiltration of Google Fi, which led to a SIM swapping issue, which uh, again, I'll cover towards the end if you're not familiar with SIM swaps. So. I've, I've covered this in other uh, cyber uh, security, cyber attack scenarios where just because uh, your company wasn't directly attacked, do, uh, you know, at, at, from a customer perspective, uh, a company that you're, you're um, that's servicing a need, uh, just because they're not directly attacked doesn't mean that there can't be correlated attacks. Uh, many times these attackers will obtain information uh, from uh, attacks on institutions from darknet markets, DNMs, uh, but sometimes they'll take it uh, directly and utilize it uh, and find, you know, they're, they're phenomenal at, at data mining and figure out that, oh, you know, we've got a another point of contact here to be able to obtain information. So uh, that is, I think, highly relevant to this day and age where you have companies that are partnering with other companies and that's happening in the digital asset space and that's happened for a long time in the traditional space which is why you see a lot of what's going on in the digital asset space of the uh, uh, aggregation and partnerships that when things uh, go bad uh, it tends to produce a um, a trickle down effect. So one, you know, to, to, to kind of cover some of what uh, data was stolen, uh, you know, it's, it's important to note that, uh, you know, phone numbers, uh, birthdays, billing addresses, people's names, emails, all of these things were taken in the T-Mobile breach. And that is then again what led to them being able to infiltrate the accounts at um, at Google and and be able to begin the uh, SIM uh, swap attack on um, on Google Fi and and it's also important to note that there's there there are these long uh, lags between when the attackers actually get in to a system and when it's identified. So for instance, T-Mobile came out, uh, it was around January 5th that they they issued a statement that uh, that 
they believe that bad actors have been taking data. And what they found was that went all the way back to uh, November 25th, right before Thanksgiving of last year. So for several months, uh, they had time to mill around in there and extract data. And uh, again, it led to 37 million uh, postpaid and prepaid customers um, involved in this breach. So with that then, you hopefully have a better understanding as to kind of what transpired. You've got one company that has partners uh, to help them provide a service that the partners were then attacked, which led to an attack uh, by the the uh, main company uh, again itself. And so you, you see this frequently happen. Um, I think some of the things that people need to be aware of, and I've mentioned this in some of my uh, posts uh, on my CPE shorts, is around uh, SMS and uh, MMS. And I, I didn't really explain the, the difference in those videos, but um, SMS is basically text messaging. It's, it's short message service. That's what SMS stands for. And it's actually been around since the 80s. And, and so it's, it's not like this new technology or anything. Uh, kind of like blockchain technology has been around since 1949, as defined by Dr. Claude Shannon in 1949 in his Bell Lab papers uh, that was originally conceived as block ciphers. Uh, but then you also have this MMS, Multimedia Messaging Service. So what that allows you to do is um, it, it's using the same M SMS technology, but what it does is allow you to then send video, um, phone contacts, uh, you, you can send audio, all these different things. So in essence, using a very similar base technology, MMS, uh, presents exploit potentials of its own. So it's important to understand what SMS and MMS are before we kind of jump into what these uh, SIM swaps do and some ways to protect yourself. So if you're not familiar with SIM swaps, there's a legitimate and illegitimate um, nefarious uh, SIM swapping that takes place. So for instance, if you lose your phone, the phone company, you contact them, they're going to swap your SIM out into a new phone, and uh, that, that's a legitimate form of SIM swapping. Um, what you have in a nefarious uh, type activity is where the attacker, uh, given enough information, can call up the phone company, and uh, what they accomplish is uh, representing themselves as the, the phone owner, and they get the phone company to switch out the SIM that the legitimate owner no longer has access to that the nefarious actor does have access to. So you're getting all of that content uh, as an attacker in, a, in an illegitimate or a nefarious SIM swap. So that is you know, a key point uh, in regards to SIM swapping. But one of the things that I want to come back to in the SMS in terms of protecting yourself is that uh, you want to try to use non-SMS multi-factor authentications because if you do and the, uh, a bad actor gets access to that information on your phone, that two-factor uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, in essence, uh, allows them to authenticate a transaction, uh, say, in your bank account, other things outside of your phone that they've now uh, been able to get access to. Um, you want to try to keep your personal information personal. Don't uh, post about your assets online, for Pete's sakes. I see that so much. Uh, as an investigator, federal uh, agent, uh, it was great to be able to see all these posts of people, oh, I've got this boat, and I've got that bank account, and I've got this Swiss account, and anyway, that's one way to 
not not become vulnerable to an attack. Uh, beware of social engineering attacks, phishing, smishing, vishing. I'm not going to go into those, uh, but all of those typically, and I've been getting a ton of them through email, texts, and calls. Uh, it, it's it's a huge problem. Now, the carriers themselves do have uh, ways, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, to help you prevent uh, these SIM swap attacks, but all of them require an action on the customer's part. They don't just automatically uh, uh, initiate on your account. So AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, you either have to go online or call up customer service and say, hey, I want this protection on my phone. So look into your carrier and take a look at that. But uh, hopefully you found this informative from my CPE shorts. Thanks. Thank <music> you.